so spectral methods for graph partitioning uh, our focus ultimately will still be social network kind of graphs but the methods we're going to explain uh, now don't necessarily have to be applied on those kinds of graphs they are pretty general and in fact uh, in the next class the some of the spectral clustering methods we will see um, they are they don't even have to be applied to graphs uh, they can be applied to other kind of uh, data also uh, okay so let's start. so firstly let's recall uh, orthogonality of eigen vectors for symmetric matrices so let's start with that. So first of all, remember this we all remember, right? So MB, let M be a square matrix, a vector V is an eigenvector of M with eigenvalue lambda if MV is equal to lambda. All right. So with that definition, what we have is if M is a symmetric matrix and there are two eigenvectors V1 and V2 of M with the corresponding eigenvalues lambda 1 and lambda 2, where the eigenvalues are different, then we can have that the eigenvectors are orthogonal to each other. All right, so we can actually see a quick proof. So for that, we need to prove that uh, V1 transpose V2 is actually the scalar zero. Now, since uh, lambda one V1, so we can write lambda one V1 transpose V2 as this lambda one V1 transpose can be written as lambda V1 whole transpose, right? So lambda is just a scalar. So lambda V1 whole transpose V2, right? So lambda V1 is just M V1. So M V1 whole transpose is V1 transpose M transpose V2. Now we can group the second part. Uh, and since M transpose is same as M because M is symmetric, this is same as V1 transpose MV2. Now MV2 can be made into lambda to V2. V2 is also an eigenvector. So MV2 is lambda to V2. So V1 transpose lambda to V2. And then we can again bring lambda 2 to the left. So lambda to V1 transpose V2. So this means V1 transpose V2 is a scalar which multiplied by either lambda 1 or lambda 2, which are different, produces the same number. And that can only happen when it is zero, right? So then uh, V1 transpose V2 is zero. So first point for a symmetric matrix, if there are two eigenvectors corresponding to two different eigenvalues, then they are orthogonal, fine. Next is the spectral theorem for symmetric matrices. If M is an N cross N real symmetric matrix, then M has N orthogonal eigenvectors. Okay, if there are N orthogonal vectors, then they form an orthonormal basis, right? So ortho orthogonal eigenvectors of each of norm one means that's an orthonormal basis and N real eigenvalues, okay? Now, N real eigenvalues may not be all different. So there can be eigenvalues repeating corresponding to different eigenvectors. So in real eigenvalues counted with multiplicity. And they, yes? I mean, can we prove the orthogonality if the eigenvalues are same? What, what, what do you want to prove? I mean, uh, you have proved that if eigenvalues are different, then they are orthogonal. Right. Uh, I mean, can we, is there any way that we can prove that if the eigenvalues are same also that they can be orthogonal? They can be, but if eigenvalues are same, you may be actually dealing with the same vector, right? Uh, I mean, uh, uh, there can be uh, eigenvectors having same so eigenvalue, what, but what they are essentially the... saying is, uh, if the eigenvalues are same, the vectors are not. I vectors are either like you know their angle is zero, so they are the same line, or they are orthogonal. That's what you are you are saying, right? Uh, sorry, sir. Come again. So in the previous one, what you are what you are trying to say? See, if the if the eigenvalues are the same, then you may be dealing with the same eigenvector. Okay. Right. So maybe what you are trying to say is yes, eigenvalues are same, but the vectors are different. 
then yeah, let's yeah, prove that they are orthogonal. So, but but vectors are different here means that uh, vectors actually are on different lines. I mean, they can be one can be the negative of another, and all those things can happen, right? So, uh, basically, what you mean is they are on the different lines, right? So, eigenvectors are also eigenvectors modulo a constant factor, right? So, um, yeah, maybe that's what you are looking to uh, prove. Okay, but anyway, let's go on. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see if that is necessary. Uh, but essentially, here what you have is, uh, here what it says is that if even if there are, so there are actually n different orthogonal eigenvectors. That's what it says. So this particular theorem, spectral theorem. So from here, what you can say is, yeah, even if some eigenvalue is repeating, their corresponding eigenvectors will still be orthogonal. Okay. So here, if the eigenvalues are lambda one less than equal to lambda two and so on. So in, in contrary uh, to what we are used to, uh, we are used to looking at the eigenvalues from the largest to the smallest or singular values from the largest to the smallest in case of PCA. But here we will be interested in the eigenvalues smallest to largest, okay? So um, we'll typically, when we talk about the first one, we'll say the smallest one. We'll see the reasons for that. So, so here the point is there are m orthogonal eigenvectors and n real eigenvalues. Okay, if it's a symmetric real symmetric matrix. So how? So the brief proof will go like this. Um, so by the fundamental theorem of algebra, we know that the eigen eigenvalues are essentially roots of the characteristic polynomial, right? So the characteristic polynomial m has at least one complex root lambda and that will be an eigenvalue of m and an eigenvector v right so so suppose it is complex so first of all we will try to show that it's not a, the eigenvalues are not complex or that basically they are real for a real symmetric matrix uh, so note that lambda v conjugate transpose v can be written as now you can take lambda here so v v, v conjugate transpose lambda v and lambda v is mv, so v conjugate transpose mv. Then this v conjugate transpose m, this can be written as m transpose v conjugate whole transpose v. Now m transpose is m, and m transpose is m as well as m transpose uh, is actually m bar, m conjugate. So a real symmetric matrix is also called, it's a special case of a Hermitian matrix where an Hermitian matrix is a complex matrix where uh, A is Hermitian if A is equal to um, A transpose bar, right? So A, A bar transpose rather. So here you can write it as M bar V bar whole transpose V. And this M bar V bar is same as M V whole bar transpose V. Now M V is lambda V. So lambda v whole bar transpose v, lambda v is same as lambda bar v bar. Now we are not assuming real case any, anywhere yet. We are still in the complex space uh, v. And then lambda bar we can take out. So lambda bar v bar transpose v. And then what we have is again, similarly, like just like before, lambda v bar transpose v is same as lambda bar v bar transpose v. So since, uh, V is a non-zero vector, right? So V bar transpose V is an eigenvector, right? It's a norm one eigenvector. So it's it's it, the V bar transpose V is not zero. So lambda must be lambda bar. So lambda is real. Since lambda is real, V cannot be, V cannot have complex coordinates because M is real. So lambda V equal to MV, MV is real. Lambda V also has to be real, okay? So V cannot have, uh, uh, complex um, complex uh, coordinates. So then what we have is the eigenvalues are real. That is the first thing we show. Now, the rest, the proof goes on in the following way. If V1 is a real eigenvector with real eigenvalue lambda one, then what people do is they take the uh, orthogonal uh, complement. So they take the span of V1 and the orthogonal complement of uh, that span of V1. And that's actually a, that's another subspace of Rn, which is one dimensional lesser. 
right? So and then apply the same argument, same argument to find um, eigenvalues and eigenvectors of k, then take out lambda two and so on. Okay, so this is basic, basically uh, this is how they show that the there are n orthogonal eigenvectors and there are n real eigenvalues. So all are real essentially. Okay, so this is called the spectrum uh, spectral theorem for symmetric matrices. Um, it's actually applicable for uh, um, uh, yeah. Basically, there is a there is a there is a general version available for uh, Hermitian matrices in general, but we are only interested in real symmetric matrices. So next is eigen decomposition. This also something everyone knows. If M is n cross n symmetric matrix with eigenvectors v1 to vn, now we are totally uh, assuming that things are real. And the corresponding eigenvalues are lambda onto lambda n. Then m can be factorized as m equal to v capital lambda v transpose, where this v is just the eigenvector stacked up, eigenvector stacked as columns, and lambda is the diagonal matrix where the eigenvalues are also stacked, uh, basically the diagonal entries. Now, since v is orthogonal matrix, v transpose is same as uh, v inverse. So you can sometimes we need to use v lambda v transpose. Sometimes we need to use v lambda v inverse. Okay, so this is the eigen decomposition of a real symmetric matrix. So a proof is easy. So stacking all the eigenvectors into a matrix, we can write M v is equal to v lambda. It's just you know stacking up M every vector v with every vector uh, uh, times uh, the corresponding eigenvalue lambda. And then since V is orthonormal, uh, so sorry, in V is orthogonal matrix, uh, I should change this to orthogonal. Uh, v inverse is same as V transpose. So we can add M V, M equal to M V V inverse. And then M V V inverse can be written as this M V is just V lambda. So V lambda V inverse, and this is same as uh, v lambda v transpose. Okay, so this is the eigen decomposition. Now note that the eigen decomposition can also be perceived in the following way: that you are actually for every eigenvector v i, you are multiplying v i v i transpose. So not v i transpose v i. So v i v i transpose is actually the n cross n matrix, and scaling that with the factor lambda i, and this you are summing for the whole. Uh, I mean, for i equal to one to n. So it is similar to the thing we saw for singular value decomposition. Also, uh, each of these will give you an n cross n matrix here, and the first of that is the first corresponding to the first. I mean, the first first. If you if you simply write out the sum as lambda one v one v one transpose plus lambda two v two v two transpose and so on, what you will see is you will see n uh, different terms in the sum, and each term will correspond to correspond to one eigenvalue and one eigenvector. Okay, so up to this, I think these are the things which people pretty much know. Now uh, we will start to look at graphs. So suppose you know we are we are looking at one such graph is something like this. This is a small social network kind of a graph uh, where there are communities. Uh, you can clearly see that this looks like one community. One to five and seven, six, seven, eight is another community. Just for the convenience of writing things, I have named the vertices uh, one to five in the left part and six to eight in the right part. But you can always, so in a real data set, you are not going to have that. But you can always reorder the vertices, and the, your matrices will also be reordered. So, so basically, the point is, it is not a problem if you name them according to your con uh, convenience. Okay, so adjacency matrix, uh, you all know. So let G be a graph, weighted undirected graph. So you can, for simplicity, not take the weighted part. You can just say undirected unweighted graph. But let's take weighted undirected graph. Everything will follow. So weighted undirected graph with n vertices. And the weights are from a function from edge to positive real numbers. Why positive? Because if some edge has weight 0, then we'll just not have that age at all. Okay, so just consider that weight is that age is not there. 
So we'll not have any age uh, weight zero. So the weights are all positive real numbers. Then the adjacency matrix is simply an weighted graph defined in the following way that the ijth entry is the weight of the ijth edge if the edge is there and otherwise zero right so for this particular graph uh, you are going to have uh, let's say since there is no loop all the diagonal entries will be zero the the weights are not written here but i have actually drawn uh, keeping in mind uh, the you see the edges have different thicknesses so this is the reference thickness for you uh, this is 0.5, this thickness, this is, I think, 2, uh, this 2 to 5, the thickness is, I think, 3, and so on. So basically, you know, you see it's a weighted, weighted, undirected graph, okay? And it's a symmetric thing because uh, 1, 2 entry is same as the 2, 1 entry, and uh, so on, okay? Everything is clear so far. I think you have also seen undirected as adjacency matrix before, so that's also not new. Now, uh, so the next one is, okay, forget the, uh, uh, this Python code here, it, it will be necessary later. So next one is called the degree matrix. The degree matrix D of G is the diagonal matrix defined as simply every diagonal entry is the sum of the weights of that row or column, whatever way you take it, it's a symmetric thing. So how does that work then? Uh, well, this is our adjacency matrix, right? So since this is the adjacency matrix, the sum here is three. So this, the degree is three. Now we are used to, uh, our concept of degree is kind of tied to the fact that how many edges are there uh, from that vertex. Here, since we are considering weighted graph, we'll say the sum of the weights of the edges is the degree, okay? So instead of taking it as a Boolean one plus one and the degree will be two, then we'll take two plus one is the weight. Okay, so essentially from this, if this matrix is A, uh, this Python code will give you the matrix D. Fine, so this is so far very simple, right? Okay, now then the Laplacian matrix, of the graph is defined by L equal to D minus A. That means the degree matrix minus the adjacency matrix. Okay, so how does that look like then? Well, the diagonal entries were there for the degree matrix, it's a diagonal matrix and the adjacency matrix interestingly had zero in the diagonal, okay? Uh, considering that there is no self loop. So now what you're going to get is ah i'm sorry so here i think we should have had let me correct it just a moment uh, let me correct a couple of entries i forgot to do that uh, yes fine so yeah so uh, so then what happens is your and and note that in this particular case when there is no self loop the diagonal entries here are positive and diagonal entries here are zero. So diagonal entries just remain as it is. And the non-diagonal entries are only taken from the adjacency matrix, but the negative of that. So this is your Laplacian matrix. Okay. So now this is the matrix, which will be our main interest for whatever to follow. So let's uh, look at that. Now, one definition of Laplacian matrix is LG or L equal to D minus A. Let's have another uh, kind of uh, view at the Laplacian matrix in a slightly different way. So let's say, instead of trying to look at the whole graph, if we simply draw a very simple graph with two vertices connected by an edge of weight one, so something like this, okay? One and two, two vertices connected by an edge of weight one. Then the Laplacian of this will be simply this matrix, right? Because their degrees are one, both having degree one and uh, minus the one, two and two, one entries are one in the adjacency matrix, so you'll get a minus, right? So this is the Laplacian of 
this graph G12, let's call it LG12, that is this matrix. Now, note that for any vector x equal to x1, x2, what we have is this form x transpose LG12 x. Okay, if we simply calculate it out, so let's do the LG1 x, LG x part. So this x1, x2. So this is x1 minus x2, x2 minus x1. And then multiply that with x, so x transpose. Then what we get is x1 minus x2 whole square. Okay. So for any vector x, x transpose L, G, x is actually a square, which means it is non-negative. Right. So for any vector x, whatever the vector is, this form is non-negative. And do you know then what will this matrix be called? Positive. Right. It's positive semi-definite because it is non-negative. I mean, it may not be positive. So it is positive semi-definite, right? Okay. So this means the Laplacian matrix, a small Laplacian matrix, the or rather the 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 smallest Laplacian matrix, uh, meaningful one, is actually positive semi-definite. Now let's actually extend this to larger Laplacians. Now let's say instead of just a graph with two vertices and one edge between them. Now let's consider a graph with n vertices, but we don't have so many edges anymore. So suppose there is exactly one edge of weight one between the nodes u and v. Okay. So then the Laplacian LGUV of this graph will only have four non-zero entries. See, no other vertex has any edge. Only u and v have an edge between them. So then all the diagonals for all other uh, rows or columns will be, all other uh, rows or columns will be zero because the degrees are zero. Okay, so only we'll have entries in case of u and v, right? So we will, suppose in this kind of a graph, if we, if we forget all other edges, only there is an edge between three and five. Okay, so if you forget all everything else, but the nodes are there, but all the other edges are gone. So if there is only an edge between three and five, then the Laplacian LG35 will basically be one, one in the third and fifth and minus one, minus one here. All right. Now, the most important part. Then for a general weighted graph, now let's fall back to our original graph like this. We can write the Laplacian of this graph as for every edge, the weight of that edge times this particular Laplacian, this particular corresponding Laplacian. If we do that, we are going to get this. Now, uh, probably intuitively, it's kind of you are getting it, but you know, let's just verify that uh, in terms of one or two entries. So let's say one, this, this entry one, so this node, node or vertex one, right? Label one, it has ages to two and three. So it has ages to two and three. The weight to two is two and weight to three is one. So that's why normally you should have a one here, one here, my, sorry, again, I have made a mistake. I'll, I'll correct it later. So minus two minus one here, by the way, uh, it's a copy paste thing. So minus two minus one, again, minus two minus one, right? Now, what are the L, what is LG one two? LG12 is simply 1, 1, minus 1, minus 1. Since the weight of W12 is 2, then what you are going to get is 2, 2, minus 2, minus 2. Now, in this sum, this minus 2, minus 2 will not be touched by any other edge because only 1, 2, we are only 1, 2 or 2, 1 will only get for from this edge but the diagonals will still be touched by other edges, right? So for one, three, the weight is one. So for one, three, you are going to have the matrix one, one, minus one, minus one. So this one and the previous two will make it a three, okay? So you see that it's actually, if you take this uh, LG for a particular edge, a matrix of this form, and if you simply overlap and keep adding, 
these matrices with the weight factor for all ages you are going to get the original laplacian graph here a uh, laplacian matrix here is this clear to everyone yes sir okay fantastic so now this formulation will actually be very important for whatever you are going to see so so now what we can uh, say is that the eigen values of the laplacian are non negative we already know that for symmetric matrices the eigen values are real right but uh, what we now will find is the eigen values of the laplacian are non negative how so first of all to do that uh, let's look at this statement so if l is the laplacian of a symmetric graph then x transpose lx is greater than or equal to 0 for all x okay all x n dimensional i mean the, there are n dimensions here the g has n nodes so the proof is we already know that the laplacian sometimes i'm writing lg and sometimes i'm simply writing l because the context is clear we are only, we are only talking about lg here so we know that l is the sum over all ages wij okay if ij is the age wij l g ij right now for every age for every age ij we have seen from this formulation lg 1 2 right that x transpose lg ij ax is xi minus xj whole square let's pause what is xi and xj Okay, for any vector x which is n-dimensional vector, right? X i is the i-th coordinate. Okay, in some way it will correspond to our i-th node or i-th vertex. Okay, so here for every edge i j, x i minus x j, uh, sorry, x transpose l g on i j x is same as x i minus x j whole square, where x i and x j are the i-th and j-th coordinates of x, and this is non-negative. So for every edge this particular thing is non negative so if we combine this and this right so this is a sum over all edges and this is for every element of that sum so every element of the sum is actually non negative so what we have is then we multiply that with weights which are also non negative weights are actually positive so weights are also positive del x is uh, this whole thing and that is actually non negative okay so now we have shown that x transpose lx is non negative for all then uh, we can come to the theorem that eigen values of l are non negative how because if we use the lemma for the eigen vector so let's say v is an eigen vector let's put that in in, term, in place of x so let's think think that v is our vector we are looking at then what we have is v transpose lv is greater than equal to 0 right so just because x transpose lx is greater than equal to 0 v transpose lv is greater than equal to 0 but lv is lambda v right because it's an eigen vector so v transpose lambda v that is lambda v transpose v now v transpose v is if the eigen vectors are normalized it is 1 otherwise it's a positive quantity anyway right so v transpose v is a positive quantity then lambda is also uh, i mean here we have assumed that it is a normalized eigen vector usually that's what we do so then it is lambda that is greater than equal to 0 so the eigen values of the laplacian are non negative fine so far okay so next is yes they are all non negative but there is one eigen value which is actually zero at least one eigen value which is actually zero Uh, so zero is the smallest eigen value of the laplacian well that is pretty uh, easy so zero is the smallest val eigen value of l and the corresponding eigen vector is the all one vector if we don't normalize if we don't normalize uh, then it's the all one vector one in all coordinates or the constant vector uh, i mean you simply normalize by uh, root over n right so it's uh, one by root over n one by root over n and blah 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 thing okay so so and that's easy to see because that comes from the definition of the laplacian so note that the sum of every row of l is actually zero why the degree is the sum of the weight of a row 
So D minus A, so every row degree minus weights by definition. So the sum of every row is actually zero. Just you know verify for from this example. Three minus two minus one, right? Seven. Uh, this should have been a minus. So minus two and minus two and minus three. Okay. Uh, so basically, and so for maybe for this one, six is the diagonal. Minus three minus two minus one, right? So there will be exactly A will have the total uh, co uh, contribution of the adjacency matrix in a row will be exactly the negative of the contribution of the degree matrix. So then obviously if we simply multiply this matrix with the all one vector here, okay, all one vector here, all we are going to get is we're going to get a three and then minus one, minus two, so minus two, minus one, right? So basically all we're basically multi summing the row, summing the rows, that's what we're doing. So we're going to get the zero. So this, uh, since no eigenvalue can be negative, zero is actually the smallest. So then what we have is the constant vector. If you want to normalize, uh, that is one by square root of n all the way is the one eigenvector and zero is the corresponding eigenvalue. And that is the smallest eigenvalue of the Laplacian. Fine. Okay, so now our main point of interest will be fine. We are happy that zero is the smallest eigenvalue. What is the second smallest eigenvalue? And the second smallest eigenvalue will be our main uh, topic of interest for this graph partitioning thing. The second value, uh, so, so, so first of all, let's notice that the second smallest eigenvalue of L is positive if and only if the graph is connected. If the graph is not connected, then we'll have another eigenvalue zero, at least. However, if the graph is connected, then there will be only one eigenvalue um, zero. That means zero will have multiplicity one only. So let's do it if and only if, right? So let's first assume that G is not connected, and then we'll show the we'll we'll show a contradiction, and then we'll uh, do the other side also. So let's say let G be disconnected then there will be at least two disconnected components g1 and g2 which have no edge between them then we can actually reorder the vertices and write the laplacian as a block matrix right so this portion will be totally separate from this portion no edge from this to this or this to this right so we can actually write because g1 and g2 are totally disconnected and then just like this block division you can do a block division of the vectors so this means one for the number of rows you have g1 and then zero for the number of rows you have g2 or in this case zero for this whole part and one for this whole part okay so then which has this basically has two eigenvectors and both with both with eigenvalue zero it is just a you know block uh, multiplication generalization of what we have seen in the previous slide so then uh, if G is disconnected, then the second smallest eigenvalue, by second smallest, we do not mean strictly second. We mean if lambda one, so we had that ordering, right? Lambda one less than equal to lambda two, less than equal to lambda three and so on. So lambda one is zero, lambda two will also be zero if G is disconnected. So that in this case, eigenvectors are partitioned in the same way as the matrix LG. So this partition exactly corresponds to this partition, okay? The blocks. Now let G be connected. Okay, if G is connected, it's an interesting thing. And then let's assume that we have another eigenvector with eigenvalue zero. So our now our claim is if G is connected, then the second smallest eigenvalue uh, is going to be positive, that means we cannot have another zero eigenvalue with this with a, another different eigenvector right so essentially this means that if we assume x is an eigenvector of lg with eigenvalue zero we have to show that x is our old eigenvector only it cannot be a new eigenvector a new eigenvector has to be orthogonal to the old one right so now what we have then is zero is same as lx because we have assumed that x is an eigenvector of l with eigenvalue zero zero is lx and since this is zero i can simply write x transpose L lx and this part is this right we know that this part is this 
uh, well, you can actually put the WIJ here, wait, doesn't matter. Uh, same thing will follow. Now, however, this portion is a sum of squares. Now, if this has to be zero, then all the squares have to be zero. That means for each edge ij, xi has to be xj. x is our vector where for, let's take a one edge, let's take the first edge. Okay, whatever the first edge is, maybe one and two, right? So let's then that means x1 equal to x2. So for each ij, the coordinates xi equal to xj. Let's then it follows for the first edge, uh, if, they are, if that edge is one, two, then x1 equal to x2. Then go to the next stage. Since G is connected, we can actually have a path from every node to every other node. Then this way we can just say, okay, first one is equal to the second one, equal to the third one, equal to the fourth one. In some order, we will actually cover whole of X, right? So this means we are, we are simply back to the old eigenvector, the constant vector, whatever X is, or whatever XI or XJ is, it has to be the same. It has to be the same constant vector. So that means all coordinates must be the same. That means if we have another uh, vector, which is an eigenvector of L with eigenvalue zero, it has to be the same vector and not a new one. So then we have proved that the second smallest, second smallest eigenvalue is positive if and only if G is connected. This is the most important uh, uh, thing about uh, today. So I hope you have all got it. Now, how do we use this to partition the graphs? First of all, we, we should only deal with connected graphs. I mean, if, if our given graph is disconnected already, uh, we can treat them as separate connected graphs, right? I mean, we, we want to partition graphs. If the graph is already partitioned, we don't, do, I mean, we don't have to do anything there. So let's focus on the connected graphs only. The goal is we should partition the vertex set of V into disjoint sets of vertices S and T such that the cut, you, you should know this from uh, in some of the previous courses in your first year, the cut is small. I mean, the definition of cut and so on, but uh, we don't really have to go that much into it. So if you have forgotten, no issues. The cut, that means the edges between S and T is small, okay? but uh, let's say your graph looks something like this. This is one natural community kind of a thing, and this is another natural community. Here we have three edges between them, and there is one outlier vertex which has one edge to this. Now, this is a whole connected graph, right? What would be the minimum cut here, which will partition the graph into two non-empty subgraphs? What will be the minimum cut? The minimum cut will be one something minute. like this, right? Yeah. It'll be something like this, but that's not interesting. I mean, you are simply, there was one poor outlier somewhere. You're simply throwing him or her out. What you wanted to do was this, right? I mean, you wanted to divide the graph into these two partitions. So the minimum cut may not be the best one we want, right? So what do you want then? We want to put another condition that the two partitions should have approximately equal number of nodes. Exactly equal may not be possible or may not even be the real case. Should be kind of, you know, they should have approximately equal, uh, they should be approximately equal in size. Because that is what we want. Now, there are uh, derivations of exactly what we mean by normalized cut and all those things. We don't actually have to go into that. Uh, if you want, you can actually read the MMDS book. Um, that chapter I have referred already here. By the way, there are a lot of references at the end of uh, this lecture. I'll, I'll talk about those things um, uh, shortly in five minutes. But uh, basically the idea is that we want uh, the cut to be such that, yeah, there should not be so many, I mean, there should, be, there should not be too many cross community edges or cross partition edges, but uh, they should also be kind of comparable in size. They should not be like a, the one should, one is a very small, another is a very big one. So then uh, what we will do is uh, we will try to find the second smallest eigenvalue. 
So we showed that the second smallest eigenvalue is positive if and only if the graph is connected. But the way we try to find the second smallest eigenvalue will actually also give us a partition of the graph. Before that, we should refer to one important theorem. Now, it's not possible to prove it here. It's a very long one and it's actually applicable for general uh, complex Hermitian matrices. Uh, um, the Kuran Fisher uh, theorem, the simplified version, if I simplify it for our case, the version would read like the following that the second smallest eigenvalue is the minimum of x transpose Lx for any x with the condition that it has norm one, okay? And I mean, this you can also, it may be misleading to write L2 norm here because we are talking about graphs, uh, but uh, you can also write just some of the, some of the squares of the coordinates equal to one. And the, it is orthogonal to the previous eigenvector. The previous eigenvector was on this line, right? One, 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 all one. So it is orthogonal to that. So le let me just tell you what the original current uh, min max principle or current Fisher min max theorem and whatever it is. Uh, what that reads is it actually gives you a general uh, guideline or general formula for uh, finding eigenvectors one by one, right? Given nothing, you find one eigenvector. Then given one eigenvector, you find the minimum of this and subject to the condition that it is x is orthogonal to all previous eigenvectors. So that's the general one. So in our case, obviously, we have only one previous eigenvector. So that's all we have here, this eigenvector one. So all we need is we want a normalization condition because otherwise I can just uh, have any scaling factor here just to uh, put that here. And we want the minimum of, we want to minimize this quantity. And for the, uh, the vector which minimizes this quantity is actually our second, uh, actually the eigenvector corresponding to our second smallest eigenvalue. Okay, so that is the current Fisher principle. And now how do we, uh, so the, it's straightforward to see the other side of it. Uh, so what this states is if you find the minimum of this subject to these conditions, then you will get the eigenvector. The other side is obviously straightforward that if it is the eigenvector, then you are actually going to get this orthogonal and this also will actually be equal to the eigenvalue, right? So those are uh, easy to see. Now, what do we achieve if we solve this constraint optimization problem of finding the second eigenvector? So let's look at that. How does it intuitively correspond to our graph? How does this quantity intuitively correspond to our graph? So, and how does it actually partition the graph? So we want to minimize x transpose Lx, and we know that again, I have, I have omitted the weight, weight term here, Wij, but you can actually put the weight term here. It, it will not be a problem. So we want to minimize this, which is same as the sum over xij, uh, sum over ij, xi minus xj whole square, right? And you have two conditions. One is the sum of the squares of the coordinate has to be one. And the second is it has to be orthogonal to the all one vector. Now, this condition essentially means what happens when you do x transpose all one? You simply sum the entries of x, right? x transpose all one. You simply sum the entries of x and the sum of the entries of x has to be zero. That means you must have a mix of positive and negative entries. Now, when x is a vector of n dimensions, n is your number of vertices. Some of the coordinates are positive, some of the coordinates of x are negative, then that gives you a partition of the graph into two partitions. One is all the entries which are positive, all the entries of x which are positive, another is all the entries of x which are negative. Is this part clear? That if you find a vector x where some of them are positive, some of them are negative, then the corresponding nodes, the positive nodes can be one partition, the negative nodes can be another partition. So that's where we are actually connecting our 
concept of partitioning to this vector x. So we are actually directly, the eigenvector will directly give us a partition. X will be our eigenvector. And what about this portion? What does this mean? This means that you want to minimize the sum of squares. We want to minimize uh, a sum of many squares. Now, none of them can be negative. They're all squares. So they can be something big positive or something small positive or zero. So then if you want to minimize, it will be good if for the k and we only sum over edges, right? We don't care where, where ij is not an edge. We don't have those terms. If ij is not an edge, then we don't have those terms. So if you look at this graph, I do not have a term 3, 7 here. x3 minus x7 whole square? No, I don't have because the edge is not there. So I only have terms like x1 minus x3 whole square. I have x7 minus x8 whole square and so on. And I want to minimize this thing. So this means whenever I have an edge, it will be good if xi and xj are same or similar. If they are same or similar, xi minus xj will be small. Small in magnitude, then their square will be small, right? So that means our, so essentially what this means is that when both are positive, xi and xj both are positive, we are putting them into one partition. They should be like same kind of numbers. When they are negative also, they should be same kind of numbers, which means the number of edges across partition would be as small as possible. Now, obviously you can think, well, why couldn't we simply take all these into one partition, all these into another partition? So simply make uh, like, uh, all, all uh, only edges between positives and only edges between. Sometimes it may not be possible because you ultimately also have to make sure that uh, it has to be orthogonal to your previous eigenvector. That means the sum has to be zero, right? So that may not be always possible, uh, but yeah, in some cases it may be. So essentially we're doing two things. One is, we have a mix of positive and negative. That means two partitions. Another is we are minimizing the cross partition edges as much as possible. So if we actually do that, if we if we find the second smallest eigenvalue of this Laplacian, we, we know the Laplacian, we have done this before, right? Then we'll figure that it is actually 0.53. The smallest was zero, the second smallest is 0.53. And our eigenvector, corresponding eigenvector will actually be beautiful it will be the first five entries will be negative and the next three will be positive. That means it will actually give you a nice partitioning. The first five will all be negative and the next uh, three will all be positive. Well, it's because it's a nicely drawn graph, right? I mean, you, you, we can actually perturb the graph a bit more and we can take larger graphs. Then it will not be so nice anymore, but still it will be pretty good. Now, some more intuition and some more insights here. See that? The number for eight is 0.25. The number for seven and six are same, 0 0.53, 0 0.53. If you look at the graph, the role of seven and six are same. Both are just connected to eight and both are connected to each other. Yeah, so they get the same number. Eight is, so these are, these are high, higher positive numbers. Uh, and this is a slightly lower positive numbers, which means that this was closer to being in the other partition. Well, it's still in this partition, but well, this was closer to zero. Similarly for this partition also, these are like somewhat more negative and this one is almost positive, like minus 0 0.110. So this is again closer to being in this partition, right? So you see that uh, not only that it's a positive negative partitioning, you also get some idea about how the nodes are close to the other community and so on. Okay, all right. So. Uh, now, obviously, we will actually look into bigger matrices and we'll play around in the hands-on in the next class. But now, so this means now what we have seen is we have seen an approach to partition a graph into two partitions. And the partitioning is going to be nice because it will be like dividing the graph into communities. But just two partitions, I mean, why so special? So we need to extend this approach. So one approach could be hierarchical clustering. You cluster G into G1 and G2. 
then in, it, iteratively apply the same approach on G1 and G2 separately. So you gain again cluster G2, uh, G1 and G2 separately. So you get a hierarchy of clustering, right? So two partitions and then each of them you can again divide into two partitions and so on. And you can go on until some kind of a threshold and stuff like that. So that's one kind of approach. Uh, the other kind of approach is partition into more than two clusters directly. Uh, I'll just give you the outline of this. We'll, we'll see this in more detail in the next class. So for that, what we do is we try to find something called an Eigen gap. I'll explain it in the next class if such a gap exists and use the first few Eigen vectors, not from the largest Eigen value, but the smallest Eigen value use the first few eigenvectors and apply dimension reduction in a little bit different way. And then maybe use some k-means kind of algorithm in the reduced dimensional space. Okay, so this we'll do in the next class. Uh, so yeah, so that's pretty much uh, it what I wanted to talk about. Any immediate question as of now? Okay, so looks like uh, for most people it is uh, it is pretty good. Now then, let me stop the recording. <laughs>